Hey everybody, thanks for coming out to the, one of the last talks at DevConf on Friday. Uh, my name is Dustin Minnick. I'm going to talk about how Red Hat IT runs our SSO servers. So if you've ever logged into access.redhat.com and filed a case or logged into our websites and downloaded some of our software or done any of that kind of stuff, that's, that's kind of what my team is responsible for doing. So I'm going to start with a problem statement. And the problem statement is SSO is very, very important. If SSO is down, we can't take your money. Tons of other applications won't work, and my team gets yelled at like crazy. So uh, of course, at Red Hat, we're going to do everything we can to use open source software. So outside of the, you know, the free aspect, the financial gains of that, and also the philosophical aspects of that, uh, using open source software allows you to do flexible things. And flexible, in this case, can mean things like we have very speci specific business requirements from time to time. Like our legal department says, uh, you know, you can't sell specific software to specific countries. So those are things we implement actually in the login flow. Um, there's also cases where since we have this up and running, we could potentially link that up with other data. So instead of going to a SaaS provider that does SSO, we could start to mine, like do data mining and say, okay, this person logged in, the last five times he logged in, he looked at OpenShift. Well, maybe the sixth time he logs in, maybe we'll send him to a page that is about OpenShift and also is going to give him a discount if they want to purchase it. Uh, so just that, that availability of data could let us do all kinds of things. We could potentially change basically the login flow or what somebody's doing on a per user basis if we wanted to do that. And that's something you won't get with, you know, the proprietary software or SaaS providers of single sign-on. The other thing that Red Hat tries to do is focus on hybrid cloud. And that's because it prevents lock-in. Um, you know, people used to complain all the time about Microsoft does things this way and Microsoft's writing their own standard. And in a lot of ways, Amazon AWS is starting to do that same thing or has been doing that same thing. So it's kind of important to us that we run SSO both on site in some of our data centers and that we're flexible enough to run it in other cloud vendors solutions. So one of those things is we have people in our company, people in our data centers, that make mistakes. So that's what I call clumsy Kyle prevention. So we have a guy, you know, he'll touch something he shouldn't touch, or he'll make changes a little bit too cowboy admin. Things will go down. Your companies probably have people like that. So do other cloud vendors. So even if you're paying exuberant amounts of money to Azure or AWS or whatever, they're still going to make mistakes. So it's important to have, you know, your systems in multiple places. It's also risk adverse because as time goes on, depending on what industry you're in and what you're doing, the people that you're hosting your SSO servers with or any servers with cloud-wise could start to become your competitors. So they could start to jack up your prices or in worst case scenarios, they could start competing with exactly what you're trying to do. Uh, so Red Hat has justifiable fears around that. So we try to spread our lo or spread our setups to different cloud providers where possible. So this is a slide about our infrastructure. We have three sites, and each site is running multiple RHSSO servers. RHSSO is the, the downstream, that's the productized version of Keycloak. And each one of those sites, those RHSSO servers, then talk to JDG. JDG is JBoss Data Grid which is downstream from Infinispan. And then they also talk to Galera. And then the JDG shares information between the sites and Galera shares information between the sites. So we have global load balancing that routes, you, routes your request to the closest geo. And we have a load balancer in each, each geo. And then we have four beefy RHSSO VMs that store and read data from MariaDB VMs and JDG VMs. Uh, so like I mentioned before, MariaDB and JDG VMs replicate to each other across sites. 
And we're currently sustaining about a million unique logins on a daily basis. And we were able to sustain a full data center outage with this setup. So we were pretty proud of that. Um, a lot of the other functionality that Red Hat offers through some of our other services uh, did not fare as well. So people could log in, but not actually do that much. But that made us look really good. Um, how we manage the different sites and the different cloud providers is with Ansible. So we have Ansible roles and playbooks that will go out and stand up VMs in Rev or instances in OpenStack or instances in AWS. And we also do our releases using Ansible. So the external or the RHSSO instances that we run, they're very heavily customized. So that's one of the great things about Keycloak is you can write your own SPIs to do different things. So, and I'll get to this here in just a second, but basically out of the box, RHSSO or Keycloak supports user federation through, uh, Ker well, through Kerberos and LDAP, but our business isn't using those things to store our user data for our external customers. So our team has been able to extend Keycloak internally to support where our customer data actually lives. A little bit about the software. If anybody was in here for the talk that Mark gave, he already went over all of this in better detail than I will. This is a one slide thing, but Keycloak RHSSO is a stable, flexible, multi-tenant capable federated SSO server. So it also supports your standard SSO protocols like SAML, OIDC, and OAuth. I mentioned that it does Kerberos and LDAP user federation. It also can do brokered and social logins, and it's manageable by a GUI or a REST API. And one of the neat things that we're starting to explore with brokered logins is actually letting different cloud providers or different vendors talk to our IDPs. So for instance, customers that are running VMs in Azure can now fairly seamlessly come over to our support portal and file you know, instance or request and tickets and stuff like that. So even though they didn't buy an entitlement through normal channels, they are using an entitlement hourly or whatever, however Azure charges for that, they can come over just like a normal customer would without having to go through the, the annoyance of lots of registration screens on both sides and go ahead and submit tickets and get it support. I did mention that Keycloak is very flexible. And again, we're doing, we have all kinds of custom SPIs that allow us to talk. In our case, we're pulling user data from Mongo. Um, we also make REST API calls to other services that people have written internally. So uh, we have APIs that we call to get additional information about users and groups. And we also have APIs that we call for legal reasons and other things of that nature. Here again, we could extend this to be as complex as we want it to be since it's flexible and open source. Uh, InfiniSpan or JBoss Data Grid is a distributed in-memory key value store. Um, if you're not familiar with InfiniSpan in general, you can think of it sort of similar to Redis if you happen to be familiar with that or Memcache. So for, what, for our setup, we've configured it in a replicated manner. That just means that whatever we're storing on one site, the other sites get the same information of, or we, they get the same information. And the InfiniSpan cluster with JDG stores runtime information. So it stores things like user sessions and offline tokens. And this allows people to do data center hopping without re-authentication, which is pretty sweet. So again, if our primary data center goes down or you lose the sticky session that our global load balancer provided you with and you now start going to a different data center, you're still gonna be logged in. Uh, we run MariaDB and you know that's kind of just the standard uh, database that tons of things use. And it stores basic Keycloak config, integration settings. So whenever you configure a client in Keycloak, that is like a, a SAML integration or a OIDC integration. So it stores those settings for each one of those clients. It also caches some user information. And we use Galera for the MariaDB replication. 
and we do that because it's synchronous in nature. And we did that to prevent race conditions. So originally when we had multiple data centers, we have some really interesting customers and interesting people that resell some of our subscription models. And basically we would have data center one and we'd have data center two. And within the same second, an account would be logging into both data centers at the same time. So you know that that's not coming from like one specific device because it would have been tracked with the sticky session or something would have happened. But we have this, we have weird situations where within a, you know, within a second, people would be logging into two places at once. And those I'm told are valid use cases. So this allows us to get past that. And also we had an issue with um, OIDC authorization code flows. So the authorization code flow would be your browser is going to get a code back. It's going to hand off that code to a backend server. And then that backend server is going to reach out to the SSO servers and swap that code for a token. And what we were seeing happen is that was faster than the MariaDB standard replication was. So the client would go and they would get a cookie and stick to DC01. They would go ahead and get that code. They'd hand it to the backend server. The backend server now does a direct call out. So he's not stuck to the same data center that the actual end user went to. They would land on a different data center and that data center would then say, I don't know anything about that code because that happened so quickly that the Maria <coughs> MariaDB asynchronous replication had not copied that code to the other data center yet. Um, I've already mentioned some of this stuff. So on top of those core products, we have our own custom special sauce. So we have user federation backends. I mentioned that this will allow us to query Mongo for users. It also allows us to do things like legal checks and uh, things of that nature. We also have different login and registration flows. So for different types of users, we have user classes. Whenever they log in, they might get different screens. And that's especially true when it comes to terms and legal agreements. And we also have different registration flows. So uh, some of the stuff that Keycloak provides out of the box is a great foundation and will actually meet most people's needs. But uh, we have a big enough company and people are particular enough about how they want things to work that we had to take some of the things that Keycloak provides out of the box, like user registration, and then customize it even further to do what the business actually wants it to do. Uh, brokering, I mentioned, uh, where we're setting up cross IDP trust between different vendors and our SSO servers. And our team's also written a new protocol support. So um, we now do Docker auth. So if you download containers in an authenticated fashion from the Red Hat container catalog, whenever you do that Docker login, you're actually logging into the SSO servers. A little bit about our future is we're trying to contemplate now that we have three sites up and running and it's working well, we're trying to contemplate what to do next. Um, one thing we haven't really tested all that much yet is how well we could do horizontal scaling versus vertical scaling. Right now, each data center has four key cloak nodes and each node has, I want to say eight cores and eight gigs of memory. And we've actually seen that those taxed at times and I mean, it's not, it's usually not core Keycloak's fault. It's usually the custom code that we've written on top of it is not optimized. And our developers have made that problem largely go away. But there is still, you know, it, it can be hefty and it can use a lot of resources. So uh, we, have to, we have to figure out, does it make sense to move that to containers? Will it scale like one core and one gig of memory? with you know, eight containers versus, or whatever. Uh, I guess it'd be more like 16 or 24 containers instead of four large VMs. Uh, better auto scaling would be great. So right now we kind of notice if things are being taxed too heavily and then we kick off some manual processes to scale out some. Uh, we're starting to ask more sites and we're starting to question if we should be 
thinking about if cheaper and more diverse is better. So right now, we have some, one of our sites is AWS, and the servers there are spanned across multiple availability zones, and they're all highly available, like all the high availability stuff is done. But I think there's questions to be asked, like instead of doing that, why don't we expand, why don't we use one availability zone and maybe one server in each availability or in each region. So, you know, instead of having big clusters in each avail or in each region, let's have more regions and smaller clusters in each region because then we would serve people closer to them. Um, we'd love to also look at blue green or canary deployments. So again, now that we have multiple data centers working, I would love to be able to say, okay, developer on my team is going to release a new feature. Let's send 10% of our traffic to that new feature that's only running in our AWS cluster, our AWS US East cl cluster. And then we can watch and see if there's any issues instead of rolling it out to all three data centers at once. Um, I'd love to see us use some Chaos Monkey type full proofing. So once you start doing active, active, active across multiple data centers, you run into weird situations and they're pretty hard to troubleshoot because it's hard to track back the path that somebody took and where the logs are or even have reproducers. So it goes from, you know, well, I'm going to hop on a couple boxes and look at logs to, okay, we definitely have to use Splunk and look at all the logs across all the data centers. And then we have to do, you know, performance profiles of each one because like AWS's T2 large isn't the same as Azure's, whatever it's called. Um, and then you're also, you know, you're victim to however, whatever hardware they're running and whatever oversell factor they have. And the same is true to our own data centers, but you gotta, you gotta be able to watch some of that stuff. And that's harder to do with the more differentiated and more spread out stuff that you have. Um, cloud data enrichment is something that Keycloak will allow us to do because it's flexible and open source. So again, I was saying that we have data about our users in Mongo locally, but we also have SaaS vendors that store some data about our users. And we can now start calling out to SaaS vendors and getting that information back about a, a user and then include that in the SAML assertion or the, the uh, access token in OpenID Connect. And we could do that, again, like on a per user basis or however we chose to tackle that problem. Um, so again, just, just a shout out to the flexibility is great. And the other thing that I'd like to see is us having site management easier. So our, our global load balancer is, um, I mean, it's a vendor, it's a well-known vendor, but you have to manage it basically through a web page and the web page is, hard to navigate and people, they like to have like a person involved and you have, you know, professional services and back and forth. Uh, I would love for us to at least have some scripts to do some easy stuff like, okay, bring down data center two and we just fire that off instead of having to get other people and other companies involved. That is all I have. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, the question was, talk about the three sites, basically what geos are they, right? Yeah, so right now we're doing very poor as far as geo distribution goes. We have, um, we have some stuff in, I believe it's either US East or US West AWS, I don't remember. I think it's US East. And then the other two data centers are also in the US, so that's not good at all. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, not cache of data, but where are the uh, user data stored? Do you have any example or something like that? Where is our actual user data stored? Yeah. So our actual user data, like usernames, passwords, email addresses, stuff like that, is stored in a Mongo database. 
Um, so we have written a Keycloak SPI that is similar to the LDAP federation uh, that comes out of the box, but instead queries MongoDB. Uh, the geo replication is normal. Is that the question? Well, MongoDB is geo replicated. Oh yes, yes, yes. MongoDB is geo replicated. Yes. Oh yeah. In the US only? Um, sure, so the question was, is the reason that we only host stuff in the US because of GDPR concerns? And I would say no, I think it's due more to poor planning. <laughs> we are running 7.2. I'm sorry, the question was, what version of RHSSO are we running in production? 7.2. Are there any major issues that we face? Um, so yes, uh, when we first started going down the, the hybrid cloud active, active, active path, the, we were doing that with Keycloak and with Galera and JDG and all of those were us working with engineering and getting that support added. Um, so when, it, when we originally started down that path, there wasn't much support for that in the product yet. Um, so we've been helping them grow and they've been fantastic with growing support for that as well. But in that growing is, you know, hitting bugs and having to file things and working through issues. Anybody got anything else? Mm -hmm. I'm what it might be. Yeah, um, so the question was, what is the valid use case where customers would log into various data centers at the same time? And some of that was basically automation test by some of our developers. And the rest of it was a very specific vendor um, that resells something that's sort of similar to satellite and to their customers with on-site appliances and they do this really nasty thing where they like scrape our login page and then enter credentials and then that logs in like, so every one of their devices that they've ever set up is scraping our login page and logging in as the same credentials. Um, we've been trying to get them to do more sane things. <laughs> Uh, be ready and hire people. Um, it's, I mean, it's a lot. So it depends on what your company is trying to do as well. So at Red Hat, we have a lot of people developing apps and it can be somebody that is literally running something on a computer underneath their desk and they want SSO support for that device. Or it could be any manager that has a corporate card wants to buy some SaaS service. So we have like, I think last I checked 120 or 130 SSO integrations on our associate, like the, what I just talked about here was our customer IDP. We also run an associate IDP for actual Red Hat employees. Um, and when, when you would purchase something from a SaaS vendor and they offer SSO support, one would hope that they would actually know what they're doing, but that is not always the case. Um, so we find ourselves spending like six months going back and forth with some SaaS vendor who has decided to write their own SAML library instead of using something that is already out there and tried and trued and tested. Um, so outside of dealing with 
that kind of stuff and knowing the protocols so that you can offer support, you also need to know, you know, Key Cloak and JDG, at least for me, adds a whole nother realm of complexity because to me that's like black magic. I don't know how that works. Um, but luckily there's a guy on my team that does. So, um, and MariaDB, like, that's easy stuff. That's, people have done that for a long time. Key Cloak itself is easy to maintain and MariaDB is easy to maintain. All right, looks like I'm out of time. If anybody has any more questions, I'll be around for a little bit. I'll also be here tomorrow, so feel free to come up. Thank you.